Hello, everybody. Hello. Happy Sunday. Fa fun fact, and I know I'm tall, so I'm going to kind of block this sometimes, but fun fact, I am running on two and a half hours of sleep. So we're going to see if these biohacking tools actually work. And you could judge it by how I performed today, because I spoke yesterday in Las Vegas at the Las Vegas Keto Expo. Red eye, 12 a.m. with my fiance, got to Miami at 8 a.m., did some red light therapy, but I should have done the energy bits with it, drank some hydrogen water, and now I'm going to use all these devices here to recharge myself. But my name is Ben Azadi. I'm grateful to be with you today. I got a presentation that's going to talk about five. I know on the calendar it said seven, but if I would have done seven, it would have been like an hour and a half. So I got it down to five biohacks for increased energy performance, health span and lifespan, as we know, those are two different things. So um, if you're not familiar with my work, I'm the founder of Keto Camp. I'm an FDNer, FDNP, proud to be an FDNP, uh, which is Functional Diagnostic Nutrition Practitioner. Reed Davis is right here. And I'm the best-selling author of four books. One of them is Keto Flex. So I'm going to give away a couple copies, or actually four copies, for those who participate. So the first question, let's start right here. I want to give a book away to the person who came here who traveled the farthest. So who thinks that's them? Where, California? Anybody from California? San Diego? Where? Portland, Oregon. Anybody farther than that? Somebody from Spain, but they're not in the room. So Port Portland, Oregon. Congratulations. Here you go. Congratulations. Pass this there, yeah. And Tecla from Kehoe was also in Vegas yesterday too, so she understands how I feel right now. All right, so let's get into the presentation. I have three more books to give away, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the book. I love keto. I'm going to talk about keto, but I'm not a dogmatic, you got to do keto and nothing else type of approach. I think it's one tool out of many tools in the shed. So I don't think we should be in ketosis long term. I think we should use it as a very smart ancient healing strategy and flex in and out similar to our ancestors. So that's going to be a part of my presentation along with other things that I'll speak about today. So I want to start here. And these are stats according to the CDC and cancer.org. And they are devastating stats. One out of three women are diagnosed with cancer within their lifetime. For men, it's one out of two. 60% of Americans are diabetic or pre-diabetic. I would guess that that's probably closer to 85% because people are not doing lab work. They're not testing their blood. They don't know what's going on. But the majority of the population has diabetes or pre-diabetes. And nobody actually dies, or I should say, it's rare to actually die from diabetes. People die from the complications from diabetes, the degeneration of it, the strokes, the heart attacks, the kidney failures, the amputations. That's how I lost my dad in 2014. It's predicted by the year 2032 that one in two children will be born on the autism spectrum. These are stats according to the CDC and cancer.org. We have a problem. We have a big problem. And it's not just the US, it's in the entire world. But we also have the solution. So being here at the Biohacking Congress, being at this presentation right now, it's gonna change your life because I know you're gonna apply this information you're going to share it with your friends and your family. And that's how we could put a dent in disease and change these stats around. We don't want to be another statistic. My dad was a statistic. I'm sure you've lost friends and family members that fell to these statistics. We don't want that. And we have control over the situation. And I'm going to share five amazing biohacks to help you take control over that situation. Another amazing stat, or I should say sad stat, according to a 2004 report, the, contri the contribution of cytotoxic chemotherapy to the five-year survival rate in adult malignancies. Survival in adults estimated to be 2.3% in Australia, 2.1% in the US. What does that mean? That means if somebody had breast cancer and they did only chemotherapy, no lifestyle changes, five, year five years later in the US, the chances of them being alive, 2.1%. Australia, 2.3%. Now, if they made lifestyle changes because it was a lifestyle disease, cancer, it would have increased that percentage very high. So we have control over a lot of these stats here, but if we just go the conventional route, 
and don't change the upstream cause, then it's going to be very difficult to heal the body. What if I told you the same food given to cancer patients in the hospital going through chemotherapy is the same food that actually could contribute to cancer growth? Because here's the truth, human beings, only species, smart enough to create their own food and dumb enough to actually eat it. Ain't the truth. When you see these on your labels, you got to, you know, think of the two words there. Well, fat-free, sugar-free, low-fat, skim milk, all natural. Just think chemical shitstorm. Because that's all it is. It's not real food. We want to eat real food. Here are some other stats on diabetes specifically, which is near and dear to my heart. I already mentioned 60% of Americans are diabetic or pre-diabetic. 68% of diabetics end up with heart disease. 16% will have a stroke. 70% will get really bad neuropathy. My dad had all of that. But look at the underlying stat there. The above statistics apply to those who are on medication. Meaning, conventional wisdom tells you diabetes is a progressive chronic disease that you cannot reverse. You just got to deal with it. We can help you manage it. They told my dad that. They're not acknowledging cause and effect. Diabetes is a lifestyle disease that needs to be treated with lifestyle changes. So we know that if we just go the conventional route, the allopathic route, it has failed us time after time after time because it does not acknowledge cause and effect. The disease is on the rise, and, and Catherine spoke about this really great. I mean, oxygen and energy deprivation is the theme. The cells, the cell membranes, this amazing orchestra of hormones that are connecting to our cells, that's the solution. Truth is, you cannot drug yourself to perfect health. And inside your body right now, 30 to 70 trillion cells inside of your body, you have this innate intelligence within you. There's no pill, there's no surgery, there's no supplement, there's no shot that could replace what you have within your cells right now. It's called the innate intelligence. I believe in God, I believe God put it there, but you could substitute that word for something else. But it's eager to work for you, this innate intelligence. Think of it as an inner physician, an inner healer that wants to go to work for you, but we have been putting blockages and interferences with this innate intelligence. I believe this, you are a masterpiece because you are all pieces of the master. And when you really understand how incredible the human body is and how it's capable of healing, you will be blown away by how amazing the human body is. Just study the cell membrane. Do some PubMed searches, Burn Scott's shaking his head. Study the cell membrane and just how magnificent the cell membrane is. I believe this innate intelligence sits within every single cell. Einstein said it best, intellectuals solve problems, geniuses prevent them. We want to be proactive, not reactive. The hard part about being in this space for the practitioners here, and even for those who, I'm sure you have friends and family that you're trying to get this message to. You know, we want you to be healthier, right, Liliana? We want you to eat better, and we want you to get off your medication. People have to go through so much pain before they make that de decision, right? But we don't want to get to that. We want to be geniuses and, and prevent the problem. So I believe every single one of you here, you're geniuses because you're here learning and applying. And we it's our duty and responsibility and obligation to share this information with every single person we know so we could really put a dent in disease. And when we look at conventional wisdom, this quote goes right along with it. The illiterate of the 21st century, it's not those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. A lot of the stuff we've been told by mainstream media, government guidelines, conventional doctors and nutritionists and dietitians. It's kind of the exact opposite of what we should be doing. So we have to, we learned it, we have to unlearn it, and then we have to relearn it. And that's how we really make a big dent in disease. I'm going to give you the three steps to healing the body. I outlined this in my book, uh, Keto Flex. Three simple steps, not easy when you actually apply them, but on paper they look easy. Number one, identify the interference. What is interfering with this innate intelligence from doing its job? It's usually multiple things. I know Reed calls it uh, healing opportunities. Number two, work on removing the interference. And that's what we're here this weekend. There's a lot of things. We talked about allergy. We talked about the supplements from Sean Wells, other incredible speakers. So many things we could do to remove that interference. Number three, allow your incredible body to heal, whether it's cancer, diabetes, 
autoimmune disease. I've seen incredible transformations. The body is so incredible. We just have to do our part, which are these three things. So I'm going to outline five biohacking tips to help you accomplish those three steps. I'm a keto guy. I think it's important to burn fat instead of sugar and flex in and out of ketosis. So the first hack is going to be get fat adapted. Now keep in mind, and I'll explain the difference later, but fat adaptation is different than keto adaptation. We have to separate that. Jimmy Moore knows all, all about that. And it's really cool, by the way, to see Jimmy Moore here because in 2013, your book, Keto Clarity, was got, got me clear, clear to keto. So uh, it's cool to see you here, Jimmy. I love you, man. So get fat adapted. What does that mean? I, wanna, I have a question. How many of you are in ketosis right now? Okay, we have a few. All right, not, not too many, not too many. Maybe after the presentation, we'll get you in there. The truth is this. Keto is not a diet. It's a metabolic process. Your body is designed to go through periods of time of ketosis. Every single one of our ancestors, guess what? They did keto. It's not a fad. It's a fact. It's not new. It's just nuanced. So when your friends and family say, you're doing that keto thing you heard about, Ben from Keto Camp, yeah, it's just a fad. It's a weight loss gimmick. Actually, every single one of our ancestors did keto. Their environment forced them into ketosis. But they also, when they had the opportunity, got out of ketosis, which is metabolic flexibility. Sean Wells talks about that. We know that I believe ketones, burning fat, is the primary fuel source for the body. And we are designed to burn fat as our, it's our birthright to burn fat. Numerous studies show it benefits all parts of your body. And if you want to get well, like my mentor, Dr. Pompa, said, you got to fix the cell. So let's relate this quote and your cells in your body to how burning fat is more superior, far superior than burning sugar. This is a truck that has all the smoke coming out of the exhaust pipe. So when we think about the human body, 30 to 70 trillion cells in the body, out of those trillions of cells, only two options for fuel. Either your cells that are stuck burning glucose and sugar, like I was, I used to be obese, or burning fat and producing ketones. When the cells are stuck burning sugar, it's a very toxic fuel source. Cells produce energy via the mitochondria and ATP. It creates toxins, cellular smoke, if you will, that the cells need to deal with. When it's burning sugar, and only sugar, it creates a lot of toxins. So I'm comparing that to a truck with all this smoke being blasted out of the exhaust pipe. That truck is not healthy for the surrounding environment. If we could teach the body and teach the cells to burn fat, I compare that to a Tesla. Much cleaner source of energy versus the truck. Same thing for your cells. When it's burning fat, much cleaner source of energy versus the sugar. So that's what we want to do. And I'm going to give you a two-step approach here to burn fat and get into ketosis in seven days without any side effects. So stay tuned for that. But here's an awesome quote by Henderson in 2008. Ketones are high-octane brain fuel throughout much of human evolution. Ketosis likely served as a valuable survival mechanism to fuel brain metabolism during times of food scarcity. Best part about this quote is here. Hence, in some ways, the modern diet can be considered keto deficient. The standard American diet is keto deficient. The average American is eating 400 grams of carbs per day. They're snacking throughout the whole day. They're eating 17 to 23 times per day. Kombucha, protein shakes, almonds, and that's the healthy stuff. So they're in this constant fed state, never entering ketosis, so we have a keto deficiency. So here are the two steps. I could take 100 of you who have never done keto, and this is important not just for those who want to do keto, but let's say you want to explain it to a family member or a friend. These are two steps that I talk about in the book. In seven days, you get them into ketosis, no keto flu, no brain fog, no symptoms required. Two easy steps. I could, get I could take 100 people, and 98 out of them, I could get them into ketosis in seven days with zero symptoms. First step is the 222 rule, which I'm going to outline. Second step is a gradual decrease in carbs, which I'm going to outline shortly. So let's talk about the first step, the 222 rule. Dr. Pompa is the one who came up with this, but here's on day one, you want to consume two tablespoons of olive oil or avocado oil, two tablespoons of coconut oil or MCT oil, two tablespoons of grass-fed butter and grass-fed ghee, and two teaspoons of sea salt. 
Now these are saturated and monounsaturated fats that support the cells and the membranes. You don't have this in one sitting. That's a question I get asked a lot throughout the whole day. So don't, you'd go to the bathroom with disaster pants if you had it all in one sitting. So throughout the whole day. And then the sea salt is there to replenish the electrolytes. As you lower insulin, you get this diuresis, you get this uh, electrolyte dumping, so it helps to replenish that. That's step one. At the same time of doing that, you gradually decrease your carbs. Like I said, the average American eats 400 grams of carbs per day. They should not go to 50 grams on day one. That's going to look ugly. They should have a gradual approach. So let's say it was 300 grams of carbs per day. On day one, they go to 250. On day two, they go to 200 and et cetera until they get to under 50 grams. I like Chronometer. That's my affiliate with them, chronometer.com slash ketocamp. But there's my fitness pal. There's, just go on Dr. Google and Google it. But gradual decrease. So two, 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 two rule. That's step number one. Gradual decrease of carbs until eventually their total carbs are less than 50 grams. And in seven days, they're burning fat instead of sugar. That's called fat adaptation. You're in ketosis, I call it the great land of ketosis. You start to feel good, it's anti-inflammatory. It takes eight to 12 weeks of being in ketosis before you're keto adapted. Keto adaptation means now your mitochondria and your cells prefer ketones as the fuel source. It's just automatically uh, using ketones. So what happens then? It takes it to another level. Your brain just turns on. You feel like a rock star, mental clarity. You start to really break through with weight loss. That's eight to 12 weeks. So how I teach it in the book, Keto Flex, I teach a four pillar approach to get fat adapted, keto adapted, and then after that, we start flexing in and out. And it's gonna be different. If you're a woman who has a menstrual cycle, I'm sure uh, Kayla, I wasn't here, but I'm sure they spoke about it earlier. You gotta flex out before your period. There's a time where you wanna build progesterone and doing keto and fasting is not a good idea. If you're postmenopausal, there's a time to do that. So I'm gonna share a little bit about some protocols on how to flex, but we don't wanna stay in ketosis long term. We wanna flex in and out. Now men could be a little bit more aggressive and stay in there because we have a 24 hour hormone recycling, but women are different. Here is something else you can do, and now that I heard Catherine talk, you could throw energy bits into this equation, but 16 ounces of water, or this is how you prevent the keto flu, 16 ounces of water, two tablespoons of cream of tartar, or excuse me, apple cider vinegar, one to two teaspoons of cream of tartar for the additional potassium, and a pinch of sea salt. First seven days, make sure you're having this so you're replenishing those electrolytes. You could also get mineral supplements. You have Barton Scott here uh, with uh, upgraded formula. So you could take some minerals, but this is a simple thing to drink every single day and it'll help replenish what's being lost because the keto flu is not really a keto problem. It's really a carbohydrate withdrawal symptom. It's the electrolytes that are being dumped. How do you measure ketones? Funny story, I spoke at a conference in Orlando two months ago and I had the same slide and I outlined the three different ways and uh, I was talking about the urine strips and why I don't like urine strips, which you're about to see, and there was a vendor that was selling urine strips. <laughs> I don't think we have that here, so. Anyways, three ways to measure ketones. Beta-hydroxybutyrate in the blood, which is BHB. You have acetoacetate that's spilled out in the urine, and you have acetone in the breath. Out of these three methods, I don't like the urine, and I'm gonna explain why. When your body is efficient at using the ketones, it will not spill out in the urine, which is a good thing, but then you'll be like, oh, I'm not in ketosis, and you'll be frustrated. I get those emails and comments all the time on my YouTube channel, but you could very well be in ketosis, it's just not showing on the urine strips. A lot of people get the urine strips because it's very cheap and affordable. I don't recommend it, maybe the first few days, but after that, not a good idea. Now, breath meters have been hit or miss over the years, but BioSense does have a great machine that they came out with that does a good reading if you wanna get theirs. I'm gonna focus on blood, which is kind of the gold standard, beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is one of the three ketones. This one has the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. So I like testing with blood. I use Keto Mojo. I'm gonna give you some advanced and not, not so advanced measurements for glucose and ketones. I do recommend you check both glucose and ketones. If you're fasting, I like to see a fasting glucose between 70 and 90. Here's something that's very important when it comes to ketones. Don't chase ketones, chase results. Higher ketones are not necessarily the goal, just like higher glucose is not the goal. If you have high ketones, it probably means your body and brain's just not using it efficiently. 
but the sweet spot I've seen for most people is 0.8 to 2.8 when you're testing that blood. Now here's some advanced testing. After you eat a meal, an hour after, which is called postprandial, you want your ketones to be in that same range, 0.8 to 2.8, and you want to see your glucose be below 120. That's a good sign that you have a nice insulin response and that meal served you well. So less than 120 an hour after eating that meal. Two hours after eating the meal, ketones, same range, you want to see your glucose drop below 100. How do you test this? You could get a keto mojo, you could get a CGM that does only gives you glucose, but I think it's important to test for a little bit to see what's going on with your food. So that right there, if you're hitting all this on your keto plan, you're rocking it. If you're not, you might have some sensitivities to some foods, you might be eating too many oxalates, you might be having too many nightshades or lectins like peanuts or hummus, things we want to identify to remove it to get a better response. Here are two ways to enhance ketone production if you've been doing keto and just having trouble getting into ketosis. Here are two scientifically proven ways. C8, which is uh, an MCT, caprylic acid. These are three studies that show it enhances ketone production. MCT oil, but C8 is one of them. So I like MCT oil, caprylic acid. And then you have caffeine from coffee. So what can you do? Have your cup of coffee, clean organic cup of coffee, put a tablespoon of C8 MCT oil, and that could be a good way to enhance ketone production. Plus, it'll turn your brain on. Biohack number two, avoid vegetable oils. Why did I put that in a whole category? You're gonna see why. Some of you know why. This is a category of foods that, I call it food, but it's not really food. It leads to more disease and deaths than a high carbohydrate diet and even smoking. And I'm gonna make the point here. I interviewed two people last year on my Keto Camp podcast, Dr. Kay Shanahan. How many of you know Dr. Kay Shanahan? Yeah. She, was, uh, she wrote the book, Deep Nutrition, Fat Burn Fix. She was the nutritionist for the Los Angeles Lakers when Kobe Bryant used to play. She introduced Kobe Bryant to bone broth and she got Dwight Howard off of sugar addiction. I interviewed her, brilliant mind. I interviewed an MIT researcher, Brian Peskin. I asked him both the same question, which was, what is worse for you, smoking cigarettes every single day or eating cooked vegetable oils? So Brian Peskin, very analytical mind, he said, well, let's look at the research. And he said, if somebody smoked two packs of cigarettes every single day, within 28 years, the chances of them getting cancer is about 16%. He would think it might be higher, but according to his research, 16%. Then he said, if somebody consumed cooked vegetable oils every single day for 28 years, the chances of them getting cancer or heart disease is 86%. Now, that was just one man's opinion and research. So I asked Dr. K. Shanahan the same question, and I told her, this is the stats, these are the stats that Brian Peskin gave me. Does this line up with your research? And you know what she said? She said, actually, Ben, it's, this is closer to 100%, is what she said. These are called PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids, and Dr. K. Shanahan says PUFAs go poof. They're inflammatory, they attract a lot of oxygen. You can't really use them as an energy source. They're worse than sugar. You eat a bunch of donuts, or eat a bunch of ice cream, or take some berberine, you, you have a better response. Dihydroberberine, or do some squats, you could burn it off. You consume these vegetable oils, they will stick around for weeks and even months. They inflame your cell membranes, which block your hormones from getting in, like, uh, uh, like Catherine said, good things can't get in, bad things can't get out, not good. I have a video, I don't know if you could play, were you able to play the video? I forgot to tell you, but it's, it's how canola oil is made. If they could play it, I'll play it. If not, you could YouTube it. But canola oil is one of the toxic eight oils out there, and it's everywhere. It's highly rancid, and you're going to see exactly, or you might see exactly, how they process it. You can't get the audio? If you can't get it, it's no, it's no biggie. So I'll, I'll continue as you try to get that. So the reason these are so bad for you, these PUFAs, is because if you want to look at the science of it, the uh, double bonds that are really closely located to each other, they're attracting a lot of oxygen versus saturated, which have single bonds and monounsaturated. So it's about the inflammatory response from them. But it's not just the, sh the chemical structure of these fats, it's the way they're processed. And, and uh, oh, I, sk I skipped there. But go YouTube, go to YouTube University and type in how canola oil is made. Is that me or you? That's them, okay. It's like.
Oh, you want me to press it? Yeah, it's in the presentation. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, that's okay. We'll skip it. So go to YouTube University and watch this later. It's absolutely disgusting. I posted a video on this on my TikTok channel and it had hundreds of thousands of views. Some people were like, that's an amazing process. I see nothing wrong with it. I'm like, oh, well, it is an amazing process, but there's something very wrong with it. But here are some, here's why. They're adulterated. Now, omega-6 is not the bad guy, just like insulin is not the bad guy. It's adultered omega-6 that is bad. In fact, the cell membrane is 28 to 33 percent omega-6. Quality, stable, unadulterated omega-6s are very, very important. But these are adultered, processed omega-6. It shuts down oxygen transfer, and it, it creates a whole host of issues. Here are some studies. This one's looking at the carcinogenic effect, the cancer-causing effect of vegetable oils. Persistent oxidative stress, often involving enhanced peroxidation of PUFAs, so fat burning of uh, these bad fats, in the cell membranes, are known to enhance the development of malignant diseases. Thus, carcinogenic processes could be initiated, initiated or accelerated by lipid peroxidation-induced DNA and protein damage. So it's showing they could potentially damage your DNA and lead to disease. That's just one study. This study showed linoleic acid, which is a PUFA, uh, increases endothelial dysfunction and inflammatory marker expressions. It also asserts that diabetics have more linoleic acid in their LDL particles than non-diabetics in a vitro experiment. Corn oil, which is one of the bad fats, changes the cardiac fatty acids caused by early diastolic dysfunction without altering systolic function. This one was really interesting. I recommend everybody go look at this study in whole. It was looking at different fats and how the mitochondria uses those fats. As you have learned throughout this weekend, the mighty mitochondria, so important. Just about every single disease is linked to mitochondrial dysfunction. This looked at how the mitochondria and the cells were using different fats. And here's what it showed. Essentially, the mitochondria cannot use these PUFAs, seed oils, for an energy production. Anywhere near could use monounsaturated and saturated fatty acids. So I put that there. It's not from the study, but PUFAs equal cell death. Here's what I do. Let me give you a list for, first before I give you what I do. Here's a composition of the blue is the linoleic acid, the PUFA is the more blue, the worse, but I'm going to give it to you in an easier to follow list. This is where you want to take your phones out in a second. Right there. Here are the hateful, I'm going to call them nine, canola, corn, soybean, cotton seed, safflower, peanut, sunflower, grape seed, fish oil, yes, fish oil, and rice bran oil. Now, there's two exceptions here. There's... Three exceptions here. Safflower oil, sunflower oil, peanut oil. If you could find organic, cold pressed, unrefined version, those could be okay. Typically, you're not gonna find that, so I'm gonna throw them on the list. The other ones are, are awful. These are awful. Fish oil is, is not healthy, by the way. 83% of fish oil is rancid. The brain only wants about seven, needs about 7.2 milligrams of EPA and DHA every single day. One capsule of fish oil is 1,000 milligrams. We're getting a super physiological dose. And I could go into a whole lecture on fish oil. I think we should get the derivatives and do other things. Already? Wow. Jeez. Time's flying. Okay. I got to move on here. But when I go to restaurants, I say, hey, what do you cook your meals in? Canola, soybean. I say, the whole table is allergic. Do you have butter or olive oil? And they say, yeah. You got to tell them you're allergic. So they listen to you. So make sure. Yeah. The whole table. I was at dinner in Vegas, the Cosmo on Friday a five-star restaurant, the chef came to our table because of our guest, and I asked the chef, like, what do you use to cook here? A canola oil blend. I'm like, we're all allergic to that. <laughs> and they cooked it in butter. But you have to make the request, all right? I know it's uncomfortable. It's kind of weird. My fiance goes crazy, but you got to make the request. It goes a long way. Here are our stable fats. I got to run through these because I didn't, my time is flying, but uh, these are stable, uh, monounsaturated, saturated fats, so cook with these, use these. These are much better. i got to continue on here. Number three is fasting. Fasting is amazing if you do it the right way. The ancient Romans discovered fasting and ketosis a very long time ago. When they had individuals back then who were having epileptic seizures, they didn't know what a seizure was, so they put these individuals thinking they had demons in them, locked them in a room, starved them, fasted them, came back later, the demons were gone. What happened? They forced them into ketosis, right? We know that 
ketones help with epileptic seizures. So nothing new about keto and fasting. Pythagoras, you know the Pythagorean theorem, he required all of his students to fast for 40 days before they could enter his course so they could be in a peak mental state. So fasting is not new. Who knows the answer to this? I'm going to give a book away. No, Jimmy can't answer. What? Nope. Barton Scott got it. Three, you were close. You were close. Here you go, brother. Angus Burberry is his name. 450 pounds on day one, 180 pounds on 382. Blood work looked good. Electrolytes looked good. Uh, they monitored him. He just had water, multivitamins, coffee, and tea. So this is an extreme example to show you. We could skip a meal. We're going to be fine. This guy did 382 days. I... <laughs> Exactly. He skipped a lot of meals. Yeah. He had, I would argue this. He was not eating food, but he was actually eating from his own fat stores. We could get our calories from the plate of food or from your own body fat. That's why we have body fat. I have to fly through these slides, but fasting helps with all of these conditions. Uh, it gives your gut a reset. I had a really brilliant analogy I was going to give to you, but it's going to take too much time. Just know that it resets your gut and it just gives your gut a reset because you're, we're eating too often. A University of Virginia study showed it took, takes 14 hours to process a standard American diet meal, according to Dr. Zach Bush. So you're not fasting for at least 14 hours, creating a backlog, and you're going to look like this, at least in your digestive system. Uh, this shows a study that um, what fasting can do with bacterial clearance with actually salmonella. It's like survival of the fittest when you stop eating food. Pretty cool. Helps increase gut diversity. Again, I can't really get into this because I have two more hacks, but... These are some cool studies. Another study that showed, uh, what did this show? Yeah, um, acromantio, acromantio actually helps with weight loss. So it just helps create more diversity in your gut. The more, when you stress the gut, that's one of the best ways to create diversity, stressing the gut. You don't just take a whole bunch of probiotics. That doesn't work. You gotta stress the gut, change your foods, get out of ketosis, do different approaches, and fasting is one of them. Helps with brain performance, BDNF. Counter-regulatory hormones go up, blood flow is increased. These are some studies to show that. I gotta get to the next slide, but autophagy is an amazing process. I'm sure you heard about this. Here's the analogy that I'll give to you. It's like, this is like, picture this refrigerator as the human body. You have these groceries inside the refrigerator. This is not my refrigerator. You wouldn't see these <laughs> processed foods, but we have expiration dates on all of these groceries. What would happen if you let every single grocery inside your refrigerator expire and you just leave them there? Disgusting. It's going to look like this. Mold, disease, bacteria. The body is like this refrigerator. You have cells, you have proteins, you have mitochondria that all have an expiration date. Out of the 70 trillion cells in your body, you have about 70 billion that need to go through this autophagy clearance. Fasting is one, not the only, but one of the best ways to enhance Autophagy. This is why Dr. Thomas Seafried said if you completed a seven-day water-only fast once a year, you would reduce your risk of cancer by 95% because of this maximum autophagy process. Cells are like cars. When they get old, they need to be destroyed. The opposite of autophagy is mTOR, which is growth and anabolic. Again, mTOR is not bad unless you're always an mTOR. There needs to be a balance because if you're too much mTOR, you die too soon like bodybuilders. You don't want too much fasting, you don't want too much autophagy. You gotta find what's called your hermetic zone. So there's a delicate dance here. In my book, I think I did a good job, Keto Flex, to kind of give you the steps and how to balance this out. But we wanna have both pathways on and off. We don't wanna be too much autophagy, which is too catabolic, too much mTOR, which is too anabolic. Uh, here's, I think we should view everything that we do from this lens here, which is hormesis. How many of you are familiar with hormesis? Yeah, the hormesis is just an amazing process. It's a perfect example. When you start to exercise, you're right here, and you start to do some bicep curls. Maybe you do a little bit of some wads at CrossFit. You start to benefit. You do too much exercise, all of a sudden it shoots down. Everybody has a different hormetic ceiling. You need to keep changing things up. And that was a question I was going to ask Sean Wells, how he, do, how he does it with his supplements, because if you keep doing the same thing over and over and over, all of a sudden your body creates a resistance to it and the results start to go away, that curve drops. So everything that you're going to do from this weekend, view it from your hermetic lens and go research hormesis a little bit more. I talk about it in the book. 511 rule is a KetoFlex principle. It's a seven day protocol, which is five days intermittent fasting, 18-6, eating keto friendly meals, one 24 hour fast, dinner to dinner, and then one day higher carbs, no fasting. That's a great way to balance mTOR and autophagy. It's called the 511. 
The book outlines that. The book could be found over at ketoflexbook.com. How much time do I have left? Five minutes, okay. Uh, I'm not going to have time to go through these, but there's a lot of myths about fasting. Human growth hormone goes up. Don't worry about losing muscle. It doesn't put you in starvation mode. Metabolism actually increases by 13% after a four-day fast. You don't actually, yes, your brain needs glucose, but you don't have to eat the glucose. Your body is always going through gluconeogenesis from protein and fat. So when a personal trainer or dietitian says you have to eat glucose to give your brain glucose, say, do you know about gluconeogenesis and how that happens all the time? So you don't have to eat it. Here are some fasting crutches if you're having a hard time fasting. They're not a traditional water fast, but they could actually help you get to a longer fasting window. I'm not fasting today, by the way, because I understand I only had two hours of sleep, I was on a red eye, and I'm in a stressed state. If you had poor sleep, you're having a lot of stress in your life, fasting is a stress. You shouldn't fast too much. You have to know your hermetic curve. So I ate earlier. Yesterday, when I spoke in Vegas, I fasted the whole day because I slept the night before. Perfect example. Coffee, does it break a fast? Check your glucose. If you see a, point, a five point rise 30 minutes after, yeah, you might lose some autophagy benefits, but it's different for everybody. Check your glucose. Uh, I'm going to skip through this. Hydrogen water is the fourth hack. I, I, I got to get to the fifth hack because it's the best one on the list. So I'm going to fly through this. I don't know if any other speakers spoke about hydrogen water. I'm going to give you some studies. I drank a whole bunch of hydrogen water today. Hydrogen is the smallest molecule on the periodic table. Why is that cool? Because it has the ability to cross through your cell membranes. It's what's called a selective antioxidant. It's a redox molecule, cell to cell communication. I had a whole bunch when I got off my plane today. It helps assist in autophagy. Um, here is hydrogen-rich saline activated autophagy, so it could actually could help you get, it could help you achieve more of that cellular repair and cleanup. Uh, it may lower blood glucose, so diabetics, this could be beneficial to diabetes. This study showed, uh, indicates that patients with type 2 diabetes may be able to improve their condition by supplementing with hydrogen water as daily drinking water. Uh, this one looked at diabetes as well, and it showed a positive benefit. And uh, it, it's a redox molecule, and it works perfectly with hormesis. It pushes your body the direction it needs to go to, whatever the body needs to do. Here is a great resource for you to go look. There's over 100 studies on hydrogen, hydrogenstudies.com. Go check that out. And this is the final, I got three minutes, right? I got three minutes to go through this. This is the best hack. I know it's going to sound a little silly, but you got to exercise before you exercise. I could give you all the macros and all the things you need to do, but if you don't have it going on on the inside, it's going to be very difficult to get the results you want because most of your results come from this mental six-pack. I used to be obese, and I achieved a physical six-pack. Who cares? That's more important. If a mental six-pack beats out a physical six-pack any day of the week, 90% of your results are coming from right here, the subconscious mind, your paradigm, multitude of activities and habits that you developed over your lifetime, and it's running on auto autopilot. The average person thinks 60,000 thoughts every single day, and 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts from yesterday, and it's typically negative thoughts. And if your thinking is thinking, your dreams are shrinking. Health dreams, financial dreams, relationship dreams, because you become what you think about most of the time. You don't get what you want, you get what you are, Les Brown said. So I'm going to give you a perfect example. If you think Ben's getting a little woo-woo here, I'm going to give you the science behind how the brain works. There's a part of your brain called the reticular activation system, RIS. Whatever you feed expands. So let's say you want to buy a red Tesla. Second analogy with the red Tesla today. You want to buy a red Tesla. You're on Auto Trader. You're on the website looking for red Teslas. Uh, this is a good price. That's a good price. You finally go to the dealership, and you make the deal, and you buy your red Tesla. You're driving home, and you see a red Tesla pass you, and you're thinking, that's weird. I just bought one. Chalk it up as coincidence and just keep driving home. Now you're at a red light, about to get home, and there's a red Tesla that pulls right by you. Weird. Two red Teslas and... 35 minutes, you just think it's a coincidence. And for weeks, you just keep seeing red Teslas everywhere. Now, did everybody buy a red Tesla because you just bought one? Or did you activate your reticular activation system and now you're seeing it everywhere? Therefore, if we're focusing on what's not working for us, why do I have these symptoms? Why is this happening to me? Guess what? RAS will give you more of things that's not going to work for you. But if you focus on gratitude and love and abundance, what you appreciate actually appreciates. Amen. Gratitude and love, two of the biggest healers you have in this world. So if you don't have a gratitude practice, that's the biggest biohack you could ever do in your life. 
Write down 10 things you're grateful for before bed. 10 things you're grateful for when you wake up in the morning. Watch that RAS go to work for you and turn op obstacles into opportunities. Last thing I'm going to share here, and this is from the Bible, but it's not a, a, a religious share if, if you don't believe in the Bible. Moses, as you all know, was a leader. Moses had his followers in the Bible, and he was walking through the desert. And his followers were thinking Moses is completely lost. They thought they were going to die out there in the desert. No food, no water. They're looking around like Moses is completely lost. But Moses was smart. He wanted to change the consciousness of their followers before they would, he would take them into a new territory. So they came up to Moses and said, we're going to die out here. He, and Moses looked at them and said, go pray to your God for rain, and we'll collect that rainwater and we'll survive. So they go out there and they pray to their God for rain. Hours later, no rain in sight. They walk back to Moses and say, Moses, God has forsaken us. We're going to die out here. And Moses steps back and looks around and says, where are the ditches? And they look at him and say, what do you mean ditches? And he goes, if you expected rainfall, you would have dug the ditches to collect the water. I don't see any ditches. The power of expectation is so important. People are expecting bad things to happen to them. Change that around. Dig the ditches. Change the consciousness. Bruce Lipton, biology of belief, has proven that a thought is a frequency that crosses your cell membranes and tells your DNA to produce a protein. If it's a negative thought, a fearful thought, you're watching the news all the time, it's going to be an inflammatory protein. If it's an abundant thought like the conversations we have here, it's going to be a healing protein. You have 60,000 thoughts a day. That's 60,000 opportunities to heal your body every single day. Um, who you're spending time with, I'm going to wrap this up with the last thing, I promise. Muhammad, <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi said, your beliefs become your thoughts. Your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your values. Your values become your destiny. The richest place on the earth, it's not Dubai, it's actually the cemetery. That's where people go with all their dreams still in them. So I encourage you, to do whatever it takes to follow your true passion. Live on purpose with your purpose. I want to go in my grave empty, and I hope you have that same goal. Here's my information, and I thank you so much for your energy today. Yeah. <laughs>